Human beings are capable of horrifying, spine-chilling deeds. We've all heard of the worst evils inflicted upon innocents, and every year a new case stuns us into silence, making us wonder if there's a line humans won't cross. In this series, we're going to look at disturbing real-life crimes. This is Cold-Blooded Crimes. Sean Michael Great, born August 8, 1976 in Marion, Ohio, was the son of Terry Great and Theresa McFarland, who had tied the knot two years prior. Sean had a typical childhood, playing sports in his backyard and hanging out with neighborhood children. He was the second child of his parents, with an older sibling born in 1974. Everything was well in his life when he was young, except for his shortcomings academically. As he went about his school life, whispers of his troubled past followed close behind. He had repeated both kindergarten and the first grade. But apart from that, Sean was quite charismatic and charming. An old female friend of his is on record for saying, all the girls liked Sean. But as his sixth birthday approached, the facade of a normal childhood crumbled as his parents divorced just two days before, on August 6, 1982. When Sean was 11 years old, his mother left the family in Ohio to move in with a man in Kentucky. He was unhappy with his mother's actions and did not like her boyfriends. He stayed with his father for the next four years. During this time, he went to River Valley High School, where he was a good baseball player, but he had to stop playing after breaking his arm and having surgery to remove a tumor. All the while, Sean had developed a deep hatred towards his mother. She had abandoned them to live with another man and had dated more men after that. He could never forgive her for that, so tensions between them escalated as time went by. His sister, speaking of the strained relationship between her brother and her mother, said it was a battle in the household, and that was apparent at a young age between the two of them. As Sean reached the age of 18, the twisted emotions he had been bottling up for years began to surface. He was arrested for physically attacking his girlfriend. A few years later, he was arrested for breaking into his 17-year-old girlfriend's home and strangling her. Only eight months later, he broke in again, hid under the couch, and waited to attack her with a knife. And this was only the beginning of his descent into darkness. After completing his high school education in 1995, Sean, along with a juvenile accomplice, broke into a house in Marion County on October 23, 1996, to steal jewelry and money. In January 1997, he was charged with the felony of burglary and was sentenced to four years in prison. However, he was released early in October 1997. Despite his history of violence, Sean had a way of making himself appealing to women and fathered three children with different partners. But his ex-wife Amber Bauman remembers him making a chilling statement, if I can't see my daughter, no one will. This shows that even to the mother of his children, Sean showed little mercy. As he reached his mid to late 20s, Sean's behavior became increasingly unstable. He would sometimes sink into deep depressive states, and an ex-girlfriend recalls him struggling to get off the couch. He later entered a relationship with Christina Hildreth, but his true nature soon came to light. He became violent, controlling, and jealous, and would sometimes be cold and indifferent towards his partner. Sean's anger reached a boiling point when he violently attacked Hildreth, beating her in the face and strangling her, a chilling reminder of the method he would use to murder later in his life. But there was one person who knew exactly where she was, Sean himself. Sean's actions took a sinister turn with his next victim, known only as Jane Doe to the police. They had met playing badminton in their apartment complex, and Great used this opportunity to gain her trust. But once he had it, the true monster within him emerged. He locked her up in his apartment, where she endured days of torture and assault. In her own words, he abused her in every way imaginable. Her first night in captivity was filled with fear and uncertainty as Great barely slept, leaving her no chance to flee. 
The following day was worse, but Sean eventually fell into a deep sleep beside his victim, who was partially tied to the bed. His phone started to go off next to him, but he was out cold, completely oblivious to the ringing. Taking this as her chance to escape, Do quietly reached over and grabbed the phone. She dialed 911, whispering into the phone, desperate not to wake her captor. 911, what is the address to your emergency? There's a fuss. Street laundry mat. What is it? Or a street laundry mat. What's the problem? I've been abducted. What's your name? How do you spell your last name? Who abducted you? John Green. You said John Green? Sean, great. Where's she at now? Asleep. Where's she sleeping at? In the bedroom. In what bedroom? There's two houses right by the laundry street. And it's in one of those houses. But you're at the laundry mat? No, I'm I'm in the bedroom with them. What color is the house? If I'm looking at the laundry mat, which way is it? If you're looking in the laundry mat, it's on the left. Of the two. You don't know what color the house is? No. Please hurry. Did she have a car? No. Well, he said down the street. So what's your phone number you're calling me from? I don't know. Can you think it's a yellow house? I think so, but it's on the left. Is it an apartment? No, it's a house. Okay, does he own the house? No, he broke into it. Does anybody actually live there? When the authorities arrived at the house, they were shocked to discover a gruesome scene of multiple bodies, all victims of Sean's brutal killings. The women who had trusted him lay decomposing in the house where he had been residing illegally. Police went on to identify the bodies of Stacy Stanley and Elizabeth Griffith inside the home. Both women had been strangled to death. Despite being tight-lipped at first, Great finally gave in to the persistent questioning of the police and confessed to his heinous crimes. He even guided the authorities to the location of Candace Cunningham's remains, hidden in a burned-out house in Richland County, and acknowledged that he killed Rebecca Lysi over a petty $4 theft. Finally, the mystery behind these two murders was resolved. Trapped behind bars, the clock ticking towards his ultimate fate, Great now faces the looming shadow of death row. Imprisoned at the Chillicothe Correctional Institution, this cold-blooded killer is left to reflect on the atrocities he committed and the endless string of lives he destroyed. Great's execution date is set for 2025. It seems that there's a link between Sean's hatred of his mother and his descent into evil. Could it be that he was acting out his violent desires on other women that he wished he could have inflicted on his mother. Many believe this to be true. What are your thoughts on this theory? Share your thoughts in the comments section. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe for more videos like this one. Until next time.